Major Warren uh, is a, a native of uh, Connecticut. He's probably satisfying some state high school uh, grading requirement by talking about Connecticut history. Uh, so we'll, we'll hear, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, he's a graduate of the uh, uh, US Military Academy. 1999, so he's still at least a 20th century grad. Uh, uh, we have something in common there. <clears throat> uh, he, he, got his, uh, he got his PhD at uh, Ohio State University, uh, a place that I've only learned to like because they beat Alabama. I have a congenital hatred of the South, and, uh, uh, and so the only way I can come to love Ohio State is for them to, to uh, be successful against somebody like Alabama. So, but that aside, uh, uh, he uh, was commissioned in the military police corps, uh, has served in uh, uh, Afghanistan, has served with both the 10th Mountain Division and the 3rd Infantry Division, and he currently, uh, uh, is able to see my picture that's hanging on the wall over in Collins Hall on a daily basis if he chooses to. Uh, I'm an old alumnus of uh, the, uh, the Center for Strategic Leadership, and I think it's now called something else, and development. Uh, he works in concepts and doctrine. Uh, that's, a, that's a great field. That's what uh, TRADOC uh, uh, deals with. Uh, that's what Brooks Kleber was the historian uh, for, for the Army. And, and so it's, uh, it's a very uh, uh, appropriate to, to have him uh, talk about that. I know many of you are here to find out some of the history of why the casinos have the names they do in Connecticut. Uh, so he'll be able to talk to you about uh, uh, some aspects of that. Uh, but mostly he's going to talk about some, some policies and some principles and some concepts that are as applicable today as they have ever been and it's from an era that we don't very much look at, the colonial period and particularly the relations between the, the new colonists and the uh, Native Americans. Uh, and so it's a very uh, important topic and I think we'll see some, based on my discussions with him, some very uh, uh, interesting insights and some useful application uh, to, uh, to our modern situation. So without uh, any further ado, Jason, please come on up. And no fear, sir, we're only going to talk about southern New England tonight, not the south, so I think uh, you'll feel comfortable. Uh, ma uh, many thanks to the Army Heritage and Education Center for the invitation to speak with all of you this evening and the kind, uh, I kind introduction. No pressure at all tonight with my boss, Dr. Bonin, here and others in my chain of command in attendance. Um, I would like to thank them for their support. Uh, it, it's also wise for me to thank them, perhaps, because I have an evaluation report upcoming, and Lieutenant Colonel would be a decent promotion, um, especially at the War College, where I, I might be the lowest-ranking officer, at, and it certainly seems that way at times. Um, speaking of recognition, I'd like to discuss with you the inhabitants of Connecticut Colony, both native and English, who have largely been overlooked during a critical war that changed the course of New England, indeed American history. By limiting the westward expansion of the burgeoning Anglo-American sphere in 17th century North America, minimized also in the retelling of this crucial conflict were the native 17th century enemies of the Connecticut Indians. In doing so, an opportunity presents itself to explore the role of culture broadly defined as a means of historical analysis. Over the next 40 minutes or so, let's attempt to understand better the unique point of view of parties overlooked in the traditional narrative of this war while examining the utility of macro-cultural analysis and history. This will require the debunking of a number of incomplete narratives, including how the war started, how it was fought, and who ultimately won, and that's in quotes. And to attempt more controversy, I might even argue to alter Thanksgiving as we know it, although I do remain a diehard NFL fan. So the, the first thing I'd like to do is, because probably not many people are familiar with Colonial New, New England, um, I'd like to orient you to the map, as any good Army officer would as well. Um, <clears throat> so you, uh, if I could point out the major colonies, you have uh, Connecticut, um, you have Plymouth, and Mass Bay. So Massachusetts isn't one whole at this point. And you have Rhode Island here. Also of 
interest in our discussion is New York, which is off here, um, which was recently just taken back from the Dutch in 1674, so right prior to the conflict I'm going to talk about tonight. And please refer to your handouts as I'll talk about many of the Native American groups as we go along, um, which I'll also point out now. The uh, major players, we have the Mohegans and the Pequots in uh, southeastern Connecticut, and you know, we're probably somewhat familiar with those native groups tonight um, as running the casinos there. Uh, the Western Niantics, um, the Wampanoags in Plymouth, and the Nipmucks here. Also, the Mohawks are in, in this region up, up uh, further to the northwest in, in New York. Even though it was the second bloodiest war per capita in American history, retarding the development and expansion of an entire region of what became the United States. The Great Narragansett War has existed for 340 years without reference in catalogs, secondary sources, or historical documents. A coalition of American Indians killed 600 New England soldiers and unaccounted for numbers of noncombatants. The coalition also destroyed 17 white settlements and damaged 50 more accounting for 1,200 houses burned and 150,000 English pounds of damage, which back then was an astronomical sum. For their part, the English and their Indian allies destroyed Indian political and military power in southern New England, killing thousands and selling many into slavery and indentured servitude. Improperly remembered in its immediate aftermath, Americans have forgotten this war. And I'll show you some of the damage now in uh, one of the slides here. So all the X's are destroyed towns, and all the circles are damaged towns. Um, so most historians, uh, going all the way back to sort of the contemporary chroniclers of the conflict, have decided to focus on all of the destruction um, in Mass Bay and, and, and Plymouth. Um, what I, I did a different take. I decided to look at Connecticut and why Connecticut is relatively unscathed which you could see in this, uh, in, on this map that uh, it didn't suffer as much damage, hardly any compared to the other colonies. Over the course of my paper, I will explain why chroniclers and historians alike misnamed this conflagration King Philip's War and how this narrative distorted understanding of the conflict. The standard narrative of King Philip's War ignores the conflict's regional nature, downplays its leading actors, and minimizes the American Indian point of view, especially of the Pequots, the closely related Mohegans, and both native groups' enemies, the Narragansetts of nearby Rhode Island. The account evolving from a great Narragansett war allows for a more accurate perspective of the conflict. If we are to celebrate Thanksgiving, it should be for the giving of thanks to Connecticut, Connecticut's Indian allies without whose support, victory would have been nearly impossible for the English. The cultural aspect of this conflict is also salient in this forgotten story because of the close relations, in many cases even family relations, between Indians themselves and colonists themselves. The American Indians of the region south of New France's St. Lawrence River and east of the Housatonic River watershed of Western Connecticut and Massachusetts shared the same culture. Their ethnicity, languages, and cultural practices were nearly identical. Corn was king, wampum beads were queen, native groups were semi-migratory, seasonably moving to plant, hunt, and fish, while warfare practices were similar. Intermarriage between groups furthered shared culture, with the Mohegan sachem, or chief, Uncas' son Joshua, for example, leading the closely related Western Niantics. Uncas himself, in an earlier era, failed to claim the Pequot sachemship and faced banishment to the nearby Narragansetts, who were also the Pequot's eastern nemesis. Colonial relationships were even more entangled and perhaps politically incestuous. The white inhabitants of three of the four New England colonies were Puritan or Pilgrim dissenters from the Church of England, sharing identical political and religious philosophies that complemented the other. White Rhode Islanders shared the same ethnic, political, military, and economic culture, differing in, in only religious matters, though also of similar Protestant bent with the other New England colonies. Family relations were just as pronounced as with the Indian groups. John Winthrop Jr. was Connecticut's governor off and on again for more than 20 years, 
and was the son of Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop, who famously wrote that Massachusetts Bay was the shining city on the hill, a phrase which various American politicians have borrowed over the years. The initial settlers of Connecticut had come from Plymouth Colony and were soon followed by colonists from Massachusetts Bay. Given the close cultural associations of Indians and colonists within their own communities and with culture defined as not only material manifestations of a society, but also its beliefs, perceptions, and practices, how was it that Connecticut's experience in the great Narragansett War contrasted so mightily with its neighbors? And the same holds true for the Indian groups. How could closely related Southern New England Algonquians have a much different experience in Connecticut during the war years than their related contemporaries elsewhere in New England? How would these different experiences cause us to evaluate historian John Lynn's focus in his acclaimed book, Battle, on what he terms conceptual culture, which he defines as a society's values, beliefs, assumptions, expectations, preconceptions, and the like. Like Lynn, I will omit the complex theory of cultural historical analysis, but briefly comment on the widespread use of cultural interpretations and their implications. This is because Lynn is simply championing the mainstream view of academia, which employs culture as its primary means of historical analysis. How is it that almost identical interrelated cultures achieved very different military results and political experiences in the same war against the same enemies? If this premise holds, should this give the historical community pause in its full embrace of cultural analysis after the so-called cultural turn of the early 1980s, which itself was an outcropping of the emergence of social history of the 1960s that embraced gender, race, and class upheavals of the time period. Perhaps Isabel Hull's concept of organizational culture in her book, Absolute Destruction, necessitates historians teasing out the, quote, constellation of basic assumptions, patterns of practices, the group's language, myths, explanation of events, standard operating procedures, and doctrines, end quote, as a more useful tool of historical interpretation. So taking it down to sort of a micro level from the macro level. I believe this to be the case for interpreting 17th century New England as a traditional macrocultural examination in the vein of Lynn's definition appears to fall short. As we consider these culturally driven questions this evening, let us return to the reason for Connecticut's omission from the historical record. The standard narrative described by historians since the 18th century focused on the experience of Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth colonies, leading to the poor remembrance of the conflict. The contemporary and popular writings of William Hubbard, Increase Mather, and Benjamin Church dictated a history based on the respective colonies and these colonies' Indian enemies. And here's a picture of uh, Mathers on the left there. Um, you could see the traditional sort of collar. We uh, may want to bring that back for style at some point. And uh, Benjamin Church here, the famous Native American fighter on, on the right. Central to this account of the war is Metacomet, Philip to the English, son of Massasoit of Plymouth rock fame and the sachem of the Peconicut Band of Wampanoags. Here's a, a sketch of uh, King Philip, and you could tell that he is a, a Native American of some clout because he has a wampum belt around his waist. That's the, uh, the beads that were strung together, seashells essentially, um, and also the fact that he is carrying a musket. Um, not, not all the Native Americans at the time uh, had, had muskets as, as well. So that's how you could determine that uh, he is a, a, uh, a Native American of some import. Benjamin's son, Thomas Church, exaggerated Philip's role in the war when he updated his father's diary in 1719, some 43 years after the conflict. Thomas may have been the first to coin King Philip's war, as his father's force was responsible for the sachem's death during a raid in 1676. While chroniclers focused on their home turf, none of them referred to the war as Philip's during the time period of the war. Philip's warriors responded to provocations from Plymouth Colony and precipitated the conflict in late June of 1675. Plymouth had tried and executed three of Philip's warriors for allegedly killing one of their sachem's consuls, John Sassaman. 
Sassaman had told the English that Philip was conspiring against them. However, any similar instigation by the English or their Indian supporters might have sparked the war, as tensions between American Indians and whites had simmered for some time over issues of land and sovereignty. It is worth noting that although both the Wampanoag groups and Plymouth Colony were in a state of decline relative to other Indians and colonies respectively, these entities shared similar culture with those whose influence was expanding. Evidence suggests that Cannon Chet, a chief sachem of the closely related Narragansett people, actually would have led the uprising after most of the southern New England native groups had readied for combat. And here's a sketch of Cannon Chet's. Um, it's difficult to find uh, sketchings, paintings, portraits from the time period, so we're often less left with less than desirable uh, renderings after the fact. Philip was a subtle diplomat, even nearly succeeding in the winter of 1676 in bringing into the conflict native peoples from throughout northeastern North America. He ultimately failed, however, when the English allied Mohawks damaged his entreaties by raiding his diplomatic summit where Philip sought to enlist these peoples, killing a handful of warriors during two raids. In fact, Iroquois, or Iroquois invol involvement, of which the Mohawks were the easternmost native group, did not win the war against the hostile coalition as many historians claim. The late winter and early spring offensive that was the deadliest phase of the war for the colonists indicate that the Mohawks only succeeded in damaging Philip's diplomatic bargaining. Thus, the role of the Iroquois was important but indecisive. The Iroquois were from a different cultural background than the southern New England Algonquians and Delaware Algonquians of western Connecticut and southern New York. And perhaps there is room for a broader cultural analysis in this case than a more uh, targeted microcultural scrutiny that doesn't seem to work for New England. Philip also botched his combat leadership role in grand fashion. He did not seriously damage Plymouth Colony during the initial violence in and around the town of Swansea, and the English drove him from his territory in food catches on the Mount Hope Peninsula near present-day Bristol, Rhode Island. After barely escaping from Pocasset Swamp, in which the English had besieged him, Philip led his depleted band across the flooded Taunton River. English forces, including Rhode Islanders and allied Mohegan Pequot Indians of Connecticut, pursued Metacomet's band and forced battle on him, surprising his camp. So I'll show you a picture of the um, Cast of Cinnamon, he's the Pequot Sachem, and this is the uh, earliest known portrait of, uh, of a Native American in, in New England. Um, again, you could tell that he's a Native American of some import. He's wearing the uh, wampum beads around his head, and he too has a musket, although the unknown artist didn't uh, finish it. But uh, um, this is the oldest known um, portrait, as I said, and it's uh, in, in an um, a art museum in Rhode Island, the School of uh, Art and Design. At this first battle of Nipsichuk, the English Indian contingent forced Philip to stand and fight while his non-combatants fled. In so doing, Philip lost key battle captains and other warriors. He eventually escaped again. This time, he and his band arrived in friendly Nipmuc country in central Massachusetts Bay with around 75 warriors, a quarter of them armed only with bows and arrows. Besides the diplomatic failure in the winter that I've described, Philip disappeared during the war until Church killed him a year later, having been overshadowed by more capable chieftains and native groups with more warriors and resources. Yet historians have remembered the war in his name. The King Philip's War storyline also adopted a singularly New England narrative that Whiggish historians in the 19th century found appealing. At a time of sectionalism in the United States, the story of hardy New England colonists braving the savage wilderness and the peoples within its murky confines stoked white New Englanders' Victorian conceptions of honor and duty. This plotline necessarily ignored the regional aspects of the conflict, centering exclusively on the glorious efforts of the New Englanders' Puritan ancestors. Ignored in the 19th century, were the 17th century efforts of Royal New, uh, New York Governor Edmund Andros, who though attempting to blunt the expansion of the heretical New Englanders, supported them against the Indians by conducting an act of diplomacy with local native groups. 
Andros was especially effective on Long Island and in Western Connecticut, where the Algonquian peoples shared a common heritage with the colonists' adversaries. And here is a uh, rendering of Andros. I'm very jealous of his hair, by the way. That's pretty, uh, pretty nice. Um, the Narragansetts, who became the leading people in the conflict, maintained an especially close tributary re re relationship with the Long Island Indians after the defeat of the Pequots in 1637. And Andros succeeded in convincing or deterring the native Long Islanders from entering the war. In what became known as the Covenant Chain, Andros also enlisted the support of the Five Nation Iroquois Confederacy, later Six Nation with the addition of the Tuscarora, which had come up from North Carolina from a different conflict, into a century-long alliance. Although most historians exaggerate the effect of the Iroquois raids as more than disrupting the anti-English coalition's operations, Andros's efforts in orchestrating them in support of New Englanders were later obscured. This was due to the royal governor's support of the Storts, that's the dynasty in England at the time, efforts to rein in the nonconformist Puritans. After the war, Andros became governor of a political entity known as the Dominion of New England, and he was later imprisoned in Massachusetts after William and Mary deposed Charles II's son, James II, during the so-called Glorious Revolution. For this reason, New England contemporaries erased Andros's role in the war, Whiggish historians carried that erasure forward, and many historians continue to underestimate Andros. The King Philip's War plotline did not only obscure the role of New Yorkers. More significantly, for a true telling of its events, chroniclers and historians alike downplayed the endeavors of Connecticut and Rhode Island, thereby magnifying those of Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth. Both of the former colonies lacked a chronicler of stature and their critical activities, in Connecticut's case decisive, have been minimized for more than three centuries. Puritan aggressively, uh, Puritans aggressively targeted Rhode Island with land grabs, viewing it as an apostate colony seeking royal protection, largely ignoring its recorders of the conflict as well, such as William Harris, who wrote with precision about the war. The Narragansetts received similar historical maltreatment. The Narragansetts entered the King Philip's War narrative only after the colonists and their Indian allies attacked one of the group's main villages. Prior to the colonists' arrival, they had been fighting the Pequots over economic spoils in the Long Island Sound Basin. This feud carried on through the settlement of Plymouth, which we're all familiar with in 1620, and the Pequot War of the late 1630s, in which the English, with Indian aid, destroyed the Narragansett's main rivals for whom the war was named. Connecticut's Mohegan group, led by the savvy Uncas, replaced the nearby Pequots while dominating the surviving Pequot clans as the Narragansett's main contender. Both groups carried on intermittent warfare for the next 40 years until settling old scores once and for all in 1676. It was this rivalry, not that between Metacama and Plymouth, that set the stage for the broadening of the war. At first, the Narragansetts clandestinely supported Philip, though remaining technically neutral with the English. Some of the group's warriors participated in combat against the colonists and their Indian allies prior to the preemptive Great Swamp Fight of 19 December 1675. Connecticut settlers observed wounded Narragansetts en route back to Rhode Island, from the Upper River Valley, where these battles transpired. The attack on the Narragansett main fort at Great Swamp brought the powerful people into the fray. And again, you could refer to your map to uh, see some of these places. The Narragansetts contributed 10 times the number of warriors that Philip's band of Wampanoags could muster. And Indians respected their, their war leader, Cannonchet, more than Philip. Cannon Chet successfully for, forayed against the English prior to his death at the hands of Connecticut's forces in early April 1676. His death, not the demise of Philip, was the turning point for the colonists and pro-English pro Indians. As it was Connecticut's and not Plymouth's or Massachusetts Bay forces that killed Cannon Chet, and conducted the most successful operations during the conflict, the chroniclers minimized those events. In fact, 
Benjamin Church's diary, thanks to the effort of Thomas and others, became the standard account of operations. Many now widely believe the elder church fathered modern and regular tactics of raids and ambushes, and for your rangers out there, he's supposedly the sort of father of ranger tactics as well. Church did not first employ, employ such tactics, however, as Connecticut's forces in the earlier Pequot War derived joint Indian colonial battlefield cooperation. Benjamin was even less successful than Connecticut columns during combat. Hostile Indians ambushed Church a number of times, nearly wiping out his command, to say nothing of the other failures of Massachusetts and Plymouth's forces. Incredibly, Connecticut forces did not suffer a single setback in the entire course of the war. And if you remember the slide of all the destruction, you know, that's a, definitely a significant feat. But as chroniclers and historians from the late 17th century onward downplayed the role of the Narragansetts, so too did they ignore their Connecticut adversaries. Philip's narrative, emerging from these historical missteps, reflects the biases of these original chroniclers. Fueling it further, Philip's father, Massasoit, had assisted the pilgrims of Plymouth in the early 1620s. Ironically, Massasoit actually befriended the pilgrims out of a fear of the Narragansetts. Europe, European traders spread disease prior to the arrival of the pilgrims, decimating the sachem's coastal Wampanoag clans, as compared to the more inland native Rhode Islanders. They didn't get hit by a plague until the early 1630s. Historians overly relied on the chroniclers constructing the memory of a Philip-centric war story and minimized the extant records of Connecticut and New York. Hence, they ultimately failed to relate the true narrative of America's second bloodiest war per capita. A more thorough narrative of what I describe as the Great Narragansett War begins with a focus on the experience of Southern New England's Indians prior to Massasoit's greeting the pilgrims. Far from Pacific natives undisturbed in the wilderness prior to the taint of European warfare, the Indians in the region fought over scarce resources. Yukon anthropologist Kevin McBride's excavated grave sites demonstrate a 15 to 18% rate of death through combat trauma, and a quarter of those were traditional non-combatants for American Indians after European arrival. Invasions of entire peoples, similar but on a smaller scale to Europeans' early migratory ancestors, conquered and compressed existing Indian groups such as exemplified by the Delaware Indians' invasion of Western Connecticut during the late Woodland period. The Pequots and Mohegans finished this domination of other Connecticut Indians. The Pequots came to control the Long Island Sound Basin in the decades prior to English arrival, as they were more warlike and militarily effective than the more numerous Narragansetts. Warfare against the Mohawks likely steeled Pequot tactical skills as both groups acted to dominate the area of Western Connecticut previously conquered by the Delaware peoples. The Narragansetts lacked this critical contact with the Mohawks, and though they could dominate the weakened Wampanoags, they fared worse against the outnumbered but tactically dominant Pequots. It is this new world in conflict that Verrazano and Hudson and other explorers happened upon. And uh, here's a picture of Verrazano is on the left and uh, Hen Henry Hudson with a very interesting collar is on the right. Fortunately for the Narragansetts, upon English migration to the Connecticut River Valley in the mid 1630s, the Pequots ran afoul of their new neighbors over interests and honor leading to the Pequot War. The Narragansetts, along with the Mohegans, who were closely re related local tributaries to the Pequots, sought advantage at Pequot misfortune. Allying with the English, both Indian groups benefited from Pequot defeat. The rivalry over the exploding wampum trade, the shells that native groups strung together, served both Indians and whites as, as coin and status symbol, and uh, wampum's not demonetized until 1663, uh, which causes a problem because now land is the only remaining commodity for uh, Indians to trade with the English. And this fuels some of what happens prior to uh, the Great Narragansett War. This intermittent warfare, which was also regional as the Mohawks factored into it, involved all the native groups of southern New England, 
and led to scares during three Anglo-Dutch wars that the nearby Dutch would also involve themselves. The standard narrative fails to connect these critical events to the outbreak of English Indian violence in 1675, an epic failure of understanding the American Indian experience. These background events were important, not only because the Philip narrative considers the years between the Pequot War, 1636-37, and 1675 as marked by peaceful coexistence, when in fact Indian conflict was exacerbating tensions between peoples, but also because the Narragansetts developed a hatred of Connecticut and its Indian allies that determined the Rhode Island's natives' actions in 1675. Connecticut, and to a lesser extent Massachusetts Bay colonies, supported Uncas and his Mohegans during the endemic warfare of the 17th century, and even tacitly approved of the execution of the Narragansett Grand Sachem, Miantonomi, in 1643, who Canonchet later sought to avenge. Miantonomi had invaded Mohegan territory to combat Uncas's growing influence with the colonists and to disrupt his economic base. Uncas captured Miantonomi after employing a ruse on the battlefield. In an event never afterwards related, Connecticut held Miantonomi's son Massacap hostage during the Great Narragansett War and accused him of burning buildings in Hartford. The narrative of Philip's War treats these episodes, if it does at all, and as interesting interludes to the main event of Wampanoag animosity towards Plymouth. It was Narragansett rage, stoked by Connecticut and the Mohegans, however, which led to the Narragansett's feigned neutrality in 1675 and outright hostility in 1676 that nearly drove the colonial frontier back to Boston and Plymouth proper. Phillips' plotline suffers from the non sequitur of the Mohegan-Narragansett-Connecticut feud prior to the war while the more accurate Great Narragansett War narrative considers this rivalry the de facto causus belli. Indeed, Connecticut's actions on the battlefield and its successful defense of its logistical base at home, which provided food for the devastated New England colonies that could neither harvest crops in 1675 nor plant them in 1676, carried the day for the colonists. Connecticut's colonial Pequot Mohegan forces repeated raids into central and western Massachusetts to say nothing of those that wreaked havoc in Narragansett country to the east forced the anti-English Indian coalition to its knees. These raids from southeastern Connecticut into Rhode Island accounted for the capture of Canonchet, the destruction of the so-called Sunk Squaw Band of Narragansetts at the Second Battle of Nipsichuk, and other successful forays bringing in scalps and captives. Larger attacks into Massachusetts also pressured hostile groups, and in one noteworthy assault defeated the remnants of the hostile coalition on the upper Housatonic River in western Massachusetts. The basis for Connecticut's success was its fair treatment of local native groups. This treatment built on the lessons learned from the earlier Pequot War, neutralized Connecticut's potential adversaries, and in most cases, won them over as allies to fight the anti-English coalition. The Connecticut towns of Wethersfield, Middletown, Hartford, and Norwich even invited neighboring Indians into their confines for the security and sustenance of the biracial local community. This was a very foresighted policy, given Americans sometimes unethical treatment of ethnic groups, such as the infamous Japanese internment camps of World War II. Even given the above-mentioned cultural similarities to Connecticut, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay colonies acted in opposite fashion, where misguided policies of oppression even targeted the converted praying Indians, forcibly removing them to reservations on windswept islands in Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay harbors. Unethical treatment led to, the, to the, most of these co colonies' Indian groups joining the Indian coalition and providing it with critical intelligence to target colonial settlements. This led to the tally of destruction, which I pointed out on the previous map, in New England besides Connecticut. It also highlights the potential use of Hull's organizational cultural model for analysis, which I cited earlier, in interpreting these, these relationships because, again, the macro historical analysis seems to fail here. 
Connecticut's leadership played a critical role in ensuring that local relations with American Indians remained peaceful. Governor John Winthrop Jr., long the pa patron of Cassa Cinnamon's revived band of Pequots, warned colonial leaders against unnecessarily provoking the Narragansetts. His sons, Fitzjohn and Waite, carried on cultural exchanges that tied together white and Indian communities. And I have a slide here of, on the left-hand side is John Winthrop Jr., the governor, and his son, also later governor of Connecticut, uh, Fitzjohn Winthrop. Younger colonial leaders like Captains John Mason Jr. and James Avery led Indian warriors into battle. This leadership differed markedly from those of the other Puritan colonies that segregated and roughly handled friendly Indians. Pirate Captain Samuel Mosley of Massachusetts even fed an Indian woman to his dogs, an event apparently endorsed by his cousin, Governor John Leverett, who he informed of his actions, apparently without facing punishment. And there's uh, the governor, John Leverett of Massachusetts. As the great Narragansett War narrative demonstrates, Massasoit and the Pilgrims, supposed good-natured cooperation at Plymouth Rock, did not establish New England. Rather, the later cooperation of English and friendly Indians at the expense of hostile native groups in the wampum belt of the Long Island Sound Basin dictated permanent colonial settlement. The first Thanksgiving, though a pleasant tale of Indian colonial collaboration, more accurately should have been the Puritan giving of thanks to Connecticut's Prussian Indian policy of 1675-76, predicated on the earlier Pequot War. So perhaps keep Thanksgiving football, but centered on Long Island, Sound Basin with perhaps a New York Jets tradition, rather than a Plymouth, Massachusetts Bay Patriots one, although you know, they unfortunately won the Super Bowl. The misguided narrative that chroniclers and later historians constructed should have given thanks to Connecticut and its Indian allies for saving New England. Indeed, success amidst disaster. The Great Narragansett War was not the story of the good relations of Massasoit's era gone bad by Philip's generation, but rather of endemic Indian conflict during the New England epoch of 1524 to 1676 spanning Verrazano's exploration of southern New England through this conflict. This revised narrative also calls for a nuanced use of culture for historical analysis, one that delves more deeply into circumstances of particular case studies rather than a broader macrocultural interpretation that proves near, nearly useless for the great Narragansett War. Thank you very much. And I, I guess we have a little bit more time for questions, so. All right, ladies and gentlemen, do we have any uh, questions for Major Warren here? You mentioned earlier about the uh, spread of disease killing off the Indians. Mm -hmm. How large were these bands of Indians by 1660s that they could continue this war and still manage to build up tribes with, let's say, 50 to 100 uh, braves? Uh, that's a great question, sir. I actually uh, looked into some of the population. Now, it's somewhat difficult to get at just because the Native Americans obviously didn't leave written records. So um, I tried to use an interdisciplinary approach of using anthropology and archaeology. And as such, I happened to make good, good relationships with like Kevin McBride, the anthropologist that I mentioned. So looking at grave sites and using explorers' accounts of the Native Americans that they encountered, um, as well as I did an analysis um, in the first chapter of my book on uh, Indian corn. Uh, I know a lot more about corn than I ever wanted to know, but uh, uh, the northern flint version of the corn was, because this was also during a, a, t a time of climate change, um, uh, actually without any carbon either, but, um, or not, not, not much anyway, man-made. 
Um, the, uh, the northern flint corn could basically survive in any weather conditions, and it was the main staple for the Native American groups. So all those factors that I sort of looked at together indicated that the, um, the Native American population in southern New England, so not, not including what later became Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, um, was about 85,000 prior to contact at about the first diseases uh, that, that, that we know about hit in 1616, so four years before the, uh, the permanent settlement at Plymouth. By the time of the outbreak of the war that I talk about, uh, the Great Narragansett War, the Native American population is uh, decreased quite a bit. It's down to about 16,000 or so, um, 16 to 20,000, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, so, so I estimated that they could field uh, roughly you know, 2,000 warriors total against uh, the, the English population, which uh, for mainly white males, not, not, not including slaves, there, there were a number of slaves at this time in New England, um, and some indentured servants was about 50-something thousand, 52,000, somewhere in that ballpark. So those were the numbers, uh, uh, roughly. Is, is there a, an explanation for uh, John Winthrop Jr. and the Connecticut leadership to take such a different approach from their culturally similar uh, 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 people in, in Massachusetts Bay and, and Plymouth? Yes, sir. Uh, um, I actually looked. Uh, there's been a number of scholars that have done books on uh, John Winthrop Jr. himself. So uh, what's, what's happening, why is Connecticut's leadership different, essentially? There's some idiosync uh, idiosyncrasies that go into that, um, just personality-driven, and certainly can't be discounted. But in John Winthrop uh, Jr.'s case, he had served, um, there's a worldwide Calvinist movement going on during this time period. So in the late 1620s, 1628, he serves uh, on a, a, re a relief expedition to try to save the French Huguenots that are uh, um, holding up uh, in uh, ill Il Il Dury and La, La, uh, La Rochelle. Uh, so he sees warfare there. Um, the English forces are massacred essentially by the, uh, by the French. They had been poorly marshaled and equipped. Um, so some scholars think that he has a, a distaste for, for war if it could be avoided. I'm not sure if I'm willing to, to go as far as to say that he you know, was a pacifist. Um, I don't think that was the case at all, but he's certainly affected by his early experiences when you know, in the late 1620s. Um, Connecticut's also on the frontier, um, and as such, they have more concerns than Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay colonies. Um, the, the frontier line had sort of re removed from uh, Boston. As you could see, Boston and Plymouth proper, the frontier line's already advanced somewhat to the west. So Connecticut's on the frontier, so they're always thinking about things uh, like security more so than the other colonies. And uh, as I mentioned, they had just fought the Dutch. There was a series of engagements on Long Island. Connecticut actually owned most of Long Island at this time. Um, so Connecticut had had experience fighting um, actually Dutch regulars from, uh, from the uh, Old World, which is kind of unique. Um, the, the, the records are a little bit scarce on, on what exactly happened, but there were at least three battles. So Connecticut is going about these military processes, which gives them an advantage. And one of the things they learn um, from those engagements in the earlier Pequot War, which transpires on Connecticut territory, where it's only an ancillary war for Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth, is that local re relationships matter quite a bit. And I think, you know, in our own experience in I Iraq and Afghanistan, one of the things that, you know, we always try to do is get locals on our side. So that's the same kind of uh, dynamic that's happening here in Connecticut. In one episode, one of the um, sachems of the middle Connecticut Indian uh, native groups uh, calls on the Pequots. Uh, the Pequots were their patrons, so they had to act in order to keep their reputation as a, uh, as a strong group um, sort of going. So the Pequots attack the English settlements in the mid-Connecticut uh, mid River Valley in this earlier Pequot War. And what the English uh, actually learned from that episode is that um, good, good relationships would have prevented that sort of attack. Um, the sachem's name was Sequassen, and they actually apologized to Sequassen after the Pequot War. Um, so it's a combination of leadership idiosync uh, idiosyncrasies, um, leadership experience um, from Connecticut's leaders, both in the old world and the new world, and the fact that Connecticut had experienced this earlier Pequot War, 
learning the value of local re relations where the other colonies didn't. So, did I, did I answer your question? Thank you, Major Warren, for your keen insights. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Dutch regulars fighting on Long Island. Of course, Sir Edmund Andros was a professional soldier. Was there any role of uh, the British regulars, the Royal Navy, in the, the Great Narragansett War, or was it entirely the trained bands and militia of the colonists themselves and their Indian allies that fought against the hostile Indians? Uh, another very good question, sir. It was just the train bands. Now, I, um, there, there's a good study by Kyle Zellner. It's called uh, A Rabble in Arms. He's sort of the uh, keynote historian looking at New, New England uh, train bands from this time period. Um, and the, the unique thing that he points out, and that's you know reinforced with uh, s some of my my research, is the train bands were really a self defense force. So those were the ones that were guarding the towns, and in some, and mostly doing not a very good job, as you could see by the destruction um, in the you know in this slide here. Um, but the the people that actually fought were field forces that were recruited from the train bands. And this, too, was a big difference between Connecticut and Mass Bay, Plymouth, and Rhode Island. So where Mass Bay, Plymouth, and Rhode Island sent their often undesirables, as Kyle Zellner points out, um, Connecticut had more of a uh, equitable share of the upper class at the time, the sort of landed uh, air aristocracy is sending their kids out to fight more than in the other colonies. So there's more of a communal effort, and again, I attribute this to Connecticut being on the frontier. Um, for instance, at the, at the, big, the biggest uh, battle in the war, Great Swamp Fight, Connecticut loses four of its captains, and all of them are from leading families in Connecticut. So this is a, a homegrown war without English, um, any sort of English regular troops coming over. Um, part, of the, part of the reason, too, is, I mean, it goes relatively quickly. It's about a year. So by the time they would even get the word back to England, muster, send troops over, the war would have probably been over anyway. But uh, there, there wasn't much of an attempt. And there's, a, there's bad blood between the New England Puritans and the Stork Crown anyway. So perhaps they, you know, the Storts wouldn't have been as willing to send uh, troops. Um, there, there's also a parallel story that's going on during this time uh, called Bacon's Rebellion, which is going on in Virginia. Um, and in that case, it's actually a civil war between the English with bloodshed. It came close in New England with Andros and Connecticut, but it didn't come to blows. It actually did in, in, in Virginia, which is an interesting parallel. Um, so Bacon's, uh, Bacon's leading a group of you know, so-called rebels against the landed aristocracy of Governor Berkeley of Virginia. Berkeley re requests royal forces from England in, in, in a way that New, New England didn't. And uh, the English forces were actually on their way. There was a naval armada as well as ground troops. But uh, they, they arrive after the, the rebellions put down. Uh, Bacon dies of dysentery and... Uh, so so the, the whole thing folds. So, so there is some precedent for outside help. Um, the uh, Dutch regulars show up because it's uh, a longer war. The, the Third Anglo-Dutch War goes on for some years, so the, the Dutch have time to mobilize their troops and send them to the New World. And they actually capture New York, rename it New Amsterdam, and uh, make some of the colonists um, swear oath of loyalty to the uh, States General and, uh, and, and the Dutch King. What do you think the role of the intertribal rivalry played in all this? Because they, were, they did not band together. It sounded like they were fa uh, different factions. Right. Uh, yes, sir. That's uh, probably uh, something that, that led to um, the ultimate destruction of what I call the anti-Indian coalition. In the end, Philip and Cannonchet and the other anti-English leaders uh, failed to bring together all the Indians of, of New England. Had they, I think the war would have had a much different result. Um, had they brought in the Mohawks and some of the other um, bands, uh, Iroquois and Algonquian bands from uh, New France, 
um, also that could have uh, devastated the, the New England colonies. In that scenario, I think they probably would have pushed the frontier line all the way back to uh, Plymouth and Boston proper, and maybe some of the other um, key towns. But but in the end, the, the Native Americans lacked artillery, so there would be they'd have no way to actually besiege the final sort of strongholds of the English. But I think they would have been more successful had they done that. Why why they couldn't is because what I tried to explain was they had their own rivalries that predated English arrival, predated other colonial um, you know, people coming to, to the New World. So those rivalries uh, uh, meant more to them in terms of policy than banding together to fight the English. They, so um, often historians sort of take a, a, a white English-centric view of the history, and um, you know, it sort of leads to these sort of uh, explanations where you know it's always English against Indian but in, in in reality the Indians were using the English for their own purposes and their own wars conducting their own policy um, it's a, even a little bit mur more murky than that I, I don't want to go off on a too much a tangent but at, so, at some times the native tribes also uh, claimed sovereignty if it suited them so I mean this idea of like you know people that are sort of helpless Pacific natives that you know face this um, overwhelming European onslaught just doesn't live up to the facts, um, and often the native groups appealed directly to the king and said, "Hey, we we too are your subjects. Help us out here in these land um, land problems with your English colonists." So there there, there was a lot of double games going on here. Um, uh, a very good book, if you're interested on that, is Jenny Pulsifer's uh, book on sovereignty in, in, in New England, where she talks quite a, a bit about that. I, I guess the uh, typical picture of the uh, Plymouth Puritan at this time period has him holding a blunderbuss, but this is actually getting toward the end of the uh, pike and shot period in Europe. Were there actually any pike and shot formations deployed in the colonies, or were they strictly musket? That's groups? a great question for the War College. We're going to get into the nuts and bo bo bolts of tactics and operations. That's right. You know, I'm glad you asked that, sir. So, the uh, the train bands that, that that New England has are basically modeled on uh, Cromwell's New Model Army, and uh, many of um, new many New Englanders went back to fight for the Roundheads in Parliament during the English Civil Wars. So that's what they're modeling their ar army on. And they think that uh, their biggest threats are your other European forces, as was actually the case with, uh, with the Dutch. And that's why my take in my book's a little different from other historians, because they didn't happen to see. I just I happened to find one document that said, hey, there was this battle against the Dutch. And then I started to, have to reconceive um, how war was fought sort of during this time period. So the New Englanders are most afraid of other Europeans after the Pequot War. So they're drilling on the ubiquitous town greens in, in, in New England using shot formations, so that's muskets. And they're actually armed mainly with flintlocks, not the uh, matchlocks of the old world, because uh, um, the frontier, they, basically knowing that they were on the frontier, they ordered the newest, latest weapon systems for the new world. So um, where European armies don't uh, actually field flintlocks for all their troops until about 1703 or 4, in New England they're doing it as early as 1630. But they're still marshalling and drilling in, in ways that would be very familiar with Cromwell's army, with uh, using the so-called countermarch, where uh, a couple ranks of files of musketeers would march out, um, fire their volleys, and then uh, pivot about and march back while the next lines move forward through them, the so-called countermarch that they had uh, uh, adopted from actually the Roman legions way back in the day. Um, so they had put their pikes away, even though they drilled with the pikes to fight Europeans when they fought the Native Americans, uh, it, the pikes were useless. It's mainly an anti-cavalry weapon, and the, and the Native Americans weren't employing cavalry. So they turned the pikemen into musketeers, um, and so you had uh, more, more shot than, and no pike. Uh, most of Connecticut's forces were mounted dragoons, so Connecticut employs about 300 dragoons, which actually also matches uh, some of the Cromwell's uh, formations of how many mounted troops you would have in, in the new model army. Um, even the flags in Connecticut's militia are throwbacks to the train bands in London uh, for, the parli uh, for, for Parliament's army. Um, so there's a, this big uh, cross-Atlantic cross military um, system. 
Um, I, I hope I answered your question. So. Any of the sites of conflict preserved or commemorated today? Surprisingly, I did find a lot, sir, and, uh, you know, this sort of got me interested in the topic. I grew up uh, outside of Harford, and, you know, a lot of the colonial houses were still there, and uh, there, there was this tale in my town, uh, the one uh, colonial house across the street from my grandparents, suppo supposedly at a tunnel connecting some of the other houses, which uh, the colonists would flee uh, from one to the other in, in this tunnel to avoid the uh, Native Americans. So that's how I got interested in it. Um, so, yes, a lot of uh, even the houses from this time period are still there, um, especially in Connecticut, which wasn't as damaged as the other colonies. Um, my, my buddy, uh, Kevin Mc, uh, McBride from Yukon, has excavated uh, a great deal of the Pequot War sites. Um, he and I worked together um, at the mouth of the Saybrook River. You could see, um, uh, uh, I don't know if it's, it's, it's not really well represented on this map, but there, there's a fort at the mouth of the Connecticut River. Um, uh, uh, Saybrook Fort that uh, is is pretty much intact. The uh, land around it um, it hasn't been too disturbed, so you could actually figure out what happened there. Uh, Great Swamp, uh, the big biggest battle um, in King Philip's War, also is a site that uh, has been somewhat preserved. Although not not many uh, archaeologists, anthropologists have actually dug in the area, it would be possible to do so. So there's a uh, surprising number of these sites available. Uh, in fact, there's a book on it, uh, Sh uh, Schultz and Tagaius' King Philip's War. That's how they actually wrote this book, is looking at all the different sites in, in, in New England. So you might want to check that one out. Schultz and Tagaius, I believe, uh, King Philip's War, 1996. So. Not collude with my colleague. Uh, the question would be, any sense of the prevalence of uh, muskets by the Native Americans, percentage? Uh... <clears throat> About 75%, sir. So the, uh, it, in the earlier Pequot War, the Pequots only have 16 muskets for 1,000 warriors. Um, so Patrick Malone writes a book called uh, The Skulking Way of War, and he talks about uh, what he considers a tactical revolution that the Native Americans, sort of similar to the military revolution that's going on in Europe at the same time period. Patrick Malone, historian, is, is arguing that, also a former military officer, um, is, is arguing that uh, the Indians from the Pequot War to the Great Narragansett War have adopted the flintlock into their tactics. Um, so the Native Americans are sometimes better armed than the English English. Um, some of the formations still have a few match locks in them to begin the war, and the Native Americans are exclusively flint locks. Uh, the Native Americans could make their own shot, repair their own weapons, um, and make their own, fashion their own flints. Um, and that's something that's good uh, about um, interdisciplinary um, studies is I would have never known that as a historian, and, um, but my anthropologist buddies sort of dug these flints up and said, hey, the Native Americans are constructing these. Um, and the English, when they raid the Native American villages, the first thing that they usually destroy is the Native Americans' blacksmith forge, where they're fixing and fashioning and, and, and so on the uh, weapons. So um, about a quarter still are armed with uh, bows and arrows, um, which could be effective as well, um, but you know perhaps not as much so as the flintlock. The, the Native Americans don't adopt any any mash locks really because um, they're very cumbersome and they you obviously have a lit uh, match, and that doesn't you know work with Native American tactics usually, which are you know more ambushes, raids, and skirmishes. Although there are instances, as I argue in my book, where the Native Americans mass to fight. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a misnomer that the Native Americans never would stand in the field. They, they would when they sensed an advantage like any good tactical force would today. Question over there. So Jason, and you can you know, tell me tomorrow if you want, but. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> since, since your work challenges sort of the preconceived notions and previously published histories, how well is your, your work being received? And said another way, are you a heretic or a newly br a branded sage? <laughs> Well, I'd definitely be uh, in good company with the Pilgrims and Puritans as heretics uh, coming over to the New World, but I think my boss and I are often uh, comfortable in that position and uh, in, in our office, so it's not something that we're not used to. Um, 
it takes about nine months to a year to get most of the academic journals to do a, a, a review, so I'm still in the process of waiting. There should be some coming out, out soon, but my fingers are crossed. I definitely take on a lot of uh, sort of sacred cows. I mean, the name of the war, the naming convention. Um, I also take on sort of the histo historiography, as I hopefully explained about, you know, what were the English or the New, New England colonists uh, train bands trained to do? What, what were their main enemies? How did they fight? Uh, the standard explanation is they adopted the so-called skulking way of war to fight like Native Americans, which I, I don't think was the case for 99% of the co colonial forces. What, what happened was, and what Connecticut was adept at that led to all the success was the employing a large number of qualitatively superior Native Americans allowed the, um, brought the, uh, the hostile Native groups to battle so the English colonists could use their traditional European skills. So that's a much different argument than pretty much every other historian that's written on it. I just, I, um, I went deep in the records. I found some uh, records that I don't think many people have seen. I also included other colonies' records. Um, that is not always the case. I was speaking of sort of the, the parochial New, New England focus. So I looked at the New York records that actually had a lot of these tactical descriptions in there. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm different. I'm not saying that my, my, my book's perfect by any means, but I did look at other sources um, than perhaps the traditional account. Um, some historians have read my book um, and you know, told me sort of offline that they really enjoyed it and thought it was a you know, decent book. So my fingers are crossed again for the review.